Loving Jesus. Father, bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. The Ephesus problem. Verse 4 of our text, and then we're going to back up a little bit and do a little teaching. Verse 4 of our text describes a very common phenomenon that takes place in the church. Bless you, Evangelist Brown. That happens more often than not. Verse 4 describes something that we all need to guard ourselves against. It's a gradual, almost, it's so gradual that you don't notice it. It is the proverbial putting the frog in the pot where the water is room temperature and then turning the heat up and gradually boiling the frog alive. The frog doesn't notice. If you warm the water slow enough, the frog won't notice. And by the time the frog figure out what's going on, the frog is dead. This happens, the Ephesus problem, more often than not. Give an example, a person becomes a believer, they get saved, and after a few years of serving in the church, that individual is appointed to a position in the church. The individual is given responsibility in the church. Um, responsibilities that require that the person make decisions. Responsibilities that require uh, that the individual is responsible for a aspect of the ministry. As the burden of that responsibility is realized over time, gradually, almost without even being, without noticing it, that person drifts from being a disciple of Jesus Christ to becoming a servant of that position, that responsibility. The sheer weight of what he or she is given to do becomes the new motivation for attending church, for attending service. They began to connect more. They identify more with being the pastor or the bishop or the first assistant or the second or whatever the position is to the point where if they lose that position, they have nothing in common with the Lord anymore. They don't even know that over time, their commitment to the Lord shifted from loving him to loving that job. They got to the point where they began to derive their sense of self-worth and fulfillment and success in the Lord based solely upon how they perform that task. If they do a good job with that task, then in their minds, they, they've served the Lord. Even if they hadn't, hadn't sought the Lord in six months, even if they hadn't talked to the Lord in five years, they're doing a great job in that position. They, their focus shifted from being a person who loves Jesus to a person who loves, I don't know, find, trying them who said they were apostles. And finding them to be liars. Shifted uh, from loving Jesus to 
having patience and their ability to uh, not be able to bear them which are evil and not they, they, they shifted to those things but they gradually shifted away from loving the Lord. Again to the point that if they don't have those things to do anymore they lose interest in church. The truth is that person backslid a long time ago. You actually left the Lord some time ago. That's why when you lost that job, your interest in the things of God went away. The only thing you have in common with the Lord is that you're the adjutant. Or that you sing on the choir. Or that you work for the church. You have the Ephesus problem. That's the warning. That's what our Lord was talking about. And you have to admit. It's easy. To get caught up. In what you do for the Lord. To the point. That it takes the place of the Lord. Husbands, it's easy for us to get so busy providing for our families that we forget. And this is sometimes the complaint of a many wives. Uh, why we're working trying to provide things. She would say, well, honey, I want you. You can get so busy being outside the house trying to take care of the house that you, you, you forget how to love the house. That's the Ephesus problem. See, this is a message to leaders and to church workers and position holders. It's wonderful to have a position. Uh, uh, those who own, you own, your own, you, you, you own your own business. You, you got your career going. And God is blessing you. And that's a wonderful thing. But you have to be able to keep it in its place. This, this is a problem that happens to children. God gives you wonderful children. And then you hear people say, my children are my world. I put my children before everyone. My children come first. You have an Ephesus problem. Because you won't read in the Bible where it says, love your children with all your heart. With all your soul. And with all your mind. But you read that that's where we're to love the Lord. That's an Ephesus problem. Anything that becomes the new catalyst. And the new reason for serving the Lord. Other than the Lord himself. Is an Ephesus problem. I hear people. Some of my colleagues in the church of God in Christ say. I have served this church. All of my life. They love the organization. They've served the organization. They live for the organization. But they don't have a good relationship with the Lord. That is an Ephesus problem. Oh, it's not limited to denominations. Same holds true with uh, you not, the, the non-denominationalist. And your church is your shrine. Nothing matters to you except what God is doing in, at that uh, address, that locale where you are. And you judge your relationship with the Lord by the numbers and by the people who show up and, and by things going the way you want them to go. You have an Ephesus problem. The Lord wants us to be where no matter what it is we do for him, no matter what he gives us, no matter what he does for us, no matter how he showers us, the Lord want, wants it to be where if he takes those things away, there is something left. And that thing is our love for him. The Ephesus problem describes a problem of shift in focus. We used to take the time to focus on the scripture. Focus on prayer. Focus on that personal relationship. Now we focus on the choir. We focus on the music. 
we focus on saving unborn babies. Notice the things that took the place of the Lord with the church at Ephesus, none of those things in and of themselves were bad. They were quite good. They were wonderful. Don't you think? I know that works. Thy labor, thy patience. Is not patience good? And how thou canst not bear them that are evil. Is that not good? You have tried them which say they are apostles and found them liars. Is that not good? Notice this. There's no adultery in here anyway. There's no fornication. Thou hast borne and hast patience. And for my name's sake have labored. There's no homosexuality in here. And has not fainted. There's no backsliding in here. And yet, he says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. And the somewhat is so great that he says, if you don't get that part right, I'll remove your candlestick. So you, you, you can't be so busy fighting unjust law. And fighting for the definition of marriage. And for all of the things that we get caught up in. That those things become first and foremost. And Christ becomes last. That's an Ephesus problem. That's good preaching. Can't love the fashions of the church. The sound of the church. The polity and the way of the church. Of the organization of your life more than you love the Lord. Some of us have fallen in love with what God has given us. Oh, he's, he's wonderful. He'll, he'll bless you now. He'll put a wonderful chariot in your garage. He'll give you a wonderful garage. He'll put wonderful clothes on your back and put wonderful money in your pocket. Yeah, he will. He'll bless you with health and strength. He'll touch your eyes where your eyes can see. Legs where your legs walk and your tongue talk. But none of those things are the chief reasons that we ought to love him. You got to love him because he's the Lord. Praise the Lord. The focus has to remain. Somebody say, an Ephesus problem. Mm -hmm. Our text actually begins in chapter 1, in verse 4. I mentioned this, but I'll go a little deeper today. Chapter 1, verse 4, John, who is one of the four greeters of the book of Revelation. The first greeter is John. The second greeter is God the Father. The third greeter is God the Holy Ghost. And the fourth greeter in verse 5 is Jesus Christ himself. The greeting is grace and peace. Verse 4 John to the seven churches which are in, in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and is to come. That's God the Father. From him which hath the seven spirits, from the seven spirits of God, that's God the Holy Ghost. We taught that Thursday night. And from Jesus Christ, of course, that's our Lord and Savior. Grace and peace. Everybody say grace and peace. Grace. Grace and peace. We find this phrase in Paul's letters, and we also find it in the letter of 3rd John. Grace and peace, and peace, excuse me, is, is both the Hebrew and the Greek greeting. The Greek greeting is grace. The Hebrew greeting is peace. From a spiritual standpoint, the grace of God has to come before the peace of God. For there can be no peace with God without first God's grace stepping into our lives. 
God's grace is the surprise gift. His grace is his unmerited favor. That which you merit is that which you have earned. None of us are saved because we've earned salvation. None of us are here today because we've been so righteous and because we've dotted every I and crossed every T and looped every L. We're here first and foremost because the Lord has had mercy on us. The Bible teaches uh, that by grace are we saved. And then it says, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Thank God for his grace. Praise the Lord. Some of you legalists get nervous when I talk like this because grace is misrepresented today, you know, misrepresented as a, as a cheap grace thing going on. That's not what I'm talking about. But just because someone misrepresents grace, that doesn't mean that we ought not to be thankful for God's amazing grace. It was grace, praise the Lord, that has brought us safe thus far. And God's grace will lead us home. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found blind, but now I see. Grace, 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 grace. It is the surprise gift. The world didn't see the grace of God coming. Amen. It was grace that caused the Lord to uh, allow Noah to make it. The Bible says Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. Grace. And then there is the Hebrew greeting, peace, peace, shalom, peace. God's peace is why you're sitting there feeling good. It's God's peace. The peace of God is why you look good. The peace of God has your hair fixed up like that. Lipstick on. Praise the Lord. Nice suit. Peace. Peace. Peace is wholeness and health that comes from the Lord. You're sitting there and healthy. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you, you eat right. Most of us are healthy despite the diet. Uh, but you are healthy because God has been good to you. Amen. You're whole by and large because the Lord has been good. Amen. You athletes out there, uh, stop crediting your training for your performance. Give the praise to the Lord. I'm not saying that you don't train, but, but, but you see, if, if you can't train muscles that has muscular dystrophy, I don't care how much you lift, they're not going to work. So you, you, you can't train a body where if you have brittle bone disease, you can't go jogging. You can't run. You can't get on a treadmill because your bones snap. You, you can't train a body that is wrapped with disease. Praise God. Amen. He has to start with acknowledging his peace. His Wholeness, hold the wholeness of God is when God affects, he blesses every aspect of your life. Wholeness, amen. God will sanctify you wholly, spirit, soul, mind, and body. The Lord looks out for us wholly. He, he doesn't just save your soul. The Lord saved your job. The Lord saved your business. The Lord kept the flame from burning your house down. The Lord watched over you when you were in that wreck. Wholeness. Every aspect of our lives. That's God's peace. So uh, uh, John opens up with grace and peace. Praise the Lord. As a matter of fact, uh, grace and peace is a standard New Testament 
greeting, but here it introduces a benediction from the exalted trinity. It's a benediction. A benediction is a blessing. The last, you know, you ought to stay for the benediction. That's your last yeah, that's right. blessing. Some of you have never heard the benediction. You wouldn't know what it was. Say, so what are they doing now? By the grace of our Lord and Savior, be with you. And let everybody say, God, for what? why are they doing that? That's because you never stay for the last blessing. Matter of fact, anytime you got to leave early all the time, that's a sign of immaturity. The sign of a mature church is when the saints, by and large, stay for the benediction. Let me move on, but you know, y'all put me up a little late. This book, the book of Revelation, and by extension, the entire Bible is a blessing to all who read it. The Bible says in verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth and they that heareth the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Grace and peace is what the book of Revelations is all about. As a matter of fact, this book, according to verse 4, begins with grace, and according to chapter 22, verse 21, it ends with grace. The last verse of the last chapter of the book of Revelation says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. It opens with grace, and it ends with grace. Thank God for his grace. It also comes with a warning, and by extension, the entire Bible, to all who would alter this book. Revelation 22, 18 through 19 says, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. It's interesting, God doesn't say when he's going to add the plagues. The plagues may be added in this life or they may be, may be added when they're lost in the world to come. But God cannot lie. The Bible is a book to be handled properly. And when you preach it, preachers, you have to exegete it properly. You can't just add and subtract. You can't cherry pick. The Bible is right. The quickest way to get in trouble with God, the quickest way to lose your health, wealth, and your peace, your wholeness, is to mishandle God's book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from, and from the things which are written in this book. Revelation 22, 18 through 19. In our text, bear with me just for a few more minutes. I won't finish today. John was 90 years of age on a prison island called Patmos. We talked about this Thursday night. Patmos is a barren volcanic island out in the Aegean Sea. At its extremities, it's about 10 miles long and Six miles wide, located some 40 miles, this is, this is very important, offshore from Miletus, a city in Asia Minor, about 30 miles south of Ephesus. So Ephesus is about 40 miles from where John was when God gave John the revelation. The problem is, in the 40 miles, the thing that the, the, the 40 miles were 40 miles of water because Patmos is in the Aegean Sea. And uh, a 90 year old man can't swim 40 miles. A 20 year old man wasn't going to swim 40 miles out in the Aegean. According to the Roman historian, Tacitus, exile to such islands were common, was a common form of punishment for the first century. 
John was banished to this island. And he was banished um, uh, he was f as a criminal because John was a part of, a, he was a member of an illegal religious sect. At the time that John was a Christian, it was illegal, according to Roman law, to be a Christian. And yet John was a part of this illegal religious sect. And they put him in jail. And the conditions which he lived under were harsh. Remember now, he's 90. Exhausting labor under the watchful eye and the ready whip of a Roman overseer. Insufficient food and clothing. Having to sleep on the bare ground would take its toll on a 90-year-old man. It was on this bleak, barren island under brutal conditions that John received the most extensive revelation in all of Scripture. John says this in chapter 1, verse 10. John says, and we talked about this Thursday night. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He wasn't depressed. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't upset with God. He wasn't disappointed with his life. He wasn't somewhere saying, I'll just th say, thank you, Lord. I won't complain. No, John was in the spirit. John was somewhere having church at the age of 90, sentenced as a criminal, doing hard labor, God Almighty, in a camp where the Romans, uh, uh, they discovered some first century uh, uh, Archaeologists discovered on Patmos uh, evidence of mines uh, where the Romans would have their rocks uh, uh, crushed on Patmos. That's where they would crush all the rocks and use the rocks to help pave the road and uh, boulders uh, built down, breaking down into fine little rocks. And I can see John at the age of 90 throwing a hammer with no help. Old man going through. Praise the Lord. But why was he sentenced? He was sentenced because he was a part of an illegal religion. Most of us would have never gotten to Patmos because we would have denied the Lord. Say, so, oh no. We'll wait till it gets, till it becomes legal. Then we'll get right. When you save like the Bible says, you stand your ground in season or out of season. Whether they like it or whether they do not. That's the sign of a true believer. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day.